Okay, hopefully you guys can see me and hear me, yes? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So, um, hopefully you guys can also see my slides. Um, trying something a little bit differently today where I'm not having a whole separate announcement slide. I'm just putting some key announcements right on this front slide. So just a, two quick notes on this, nothing major. You guys know you have an achieve homework for chapter seven. It's currently set to be due on Wednesday of next week. And we are as usual gonna have a quiz on this chapter to keep everybody keeping up with the chapter. And that quiz will be next week, either Wednesday or Friday. And I will make that announcement a switch day on Monday. Okay. Um, as you guys know uh, from our um, the video that you guys had from class on Wednesday, we covered bonding in alkenes and stability of alkenes and also both E1 and E2 elimination. What I'm going to do today is touch on E1 and E2 again in a little bit more depth so you guys can hear me talking about it and have a chance to ask any questions. And then we'll go on and talk about alkene nomenclature and if we have time, degrees of unsaturation. But please everyone, make sure you go back and review the video from Wednesday for bonding and stability of alkenes because I'm not gonna cover that material again today. Okay, so um, I pulled out for E1, I tried to pull out some of the key points to review with everybody. And I just want to kind of go over those here. And then in E2, I'm going to go over those in, a, in much more detail because I think it's a little bit more subtle and I want to make sure everyone has all of the key concepts. But for the E1 mechanism, we're talking about here, just like for substitution, a unimolecular reaction mechanism, which means that there's only one molecule involved or one type of molecule involved in the rate determining step. And our E1 reaction mechanism is in fact going to mirror SN1 reactions, which you guys should be familiar with from chapter six. And I'll point out those comparisons along the way. The first step is identical, identical to an SN1 step, which is ionization to the carbocation, the breaking of the carbon halogen bond, the halogen leaving with those two electrons as a halide, leaving behind that carbocation as an intermediate. And of course that intermediate we know is reactive. So in the second step of an E1 reaction, a base, often the solvent, will reach out and abstract a proton, so that is a hydrogen atom without any of its electrons, from the carbon next door to the carbon of the carbocation. The electrons that used to hold that proton on will go and become the pi bond electrons in our new alkene. And so in two steps here, we've synthesized an alkene from an alkyl halide. Just as a reminder, this is considered an overall elimination reaction because we are losing a proton and an X minus. So that's a molecule of HX. And so this can be talked about as elimination of HX um, in order to uh, generate your alkene. And um, as far as I see in the chat box about what's the difference between E1 and SN1, just bear with me through these slides and I think that'll become clear in the end. So I'm not gonna address that directly now, but if you still have that question towards the end of class today, then you can post it again. Okay, in E1, we have the same type of energy diagram as SN1, where in our first rate determining step, we create this carbocation, that's an uphill step. So we get to this intermediate, which is a carbocation intermediate. This is a, a, a discrete intermediate, meaning that it exists in its entirely, entirety. The CX bond is broken entirely to get a free carbocation before the next step happens. And then in the next step uh, for E1, a base abstracts a proton to move these two electrons from the sigma bond to the pi position to get our alkene. And that step, that second step is a downhill step creating this alkene um, product. Okay, just like in SN1, that first step is the rate limiting step. And just like in SN1, we have two transition states because we have two steps in the reaction. Only the alkyl halide is involved in the rate determining step. From the slides on Wednesday, we also learned about Zaitsev's rule. So I wanna go over that here because this is gonna be a key feature and very important for E1 elimination reactions. 
Once you create your carbocation intermediate, depending on the structure of your alkyl halide that you started with, you may have more than one option for which neighboring proton to abstract. So in the case that we're looking at here on the screen, there is two different types of neighboring protons. There's the type that is shown in the blue arrow, two different pathways that our ethanol base could abstract that proton. One is the blue arrow pathway where the proton attached to the more substituted carbon is removed. So that's the blue pathway. The other pathway is the proton attached to the less substituted carbon, which in this case is a methyl group. That's the green pathway. So it turns out that the blue pathway dominates. And the reason that the blue pathway dominates is because the result of the blue pathway gives us a more substituted double bond in the end. This should make sense. The proton being abstracted is on a more substituted carbon. And so you end up with a more substituted double bond as your product, a tri-substituted double bond in this case. In the green pathway that goes off to the right, the proton is on a less substituted carbon. And so that green product, the green reaction pathway leads to the product that is only a di-substituted double bond. And so it is less stable. I have a question. Hang on one second. It's really the thermodynamics driving which of these two is the major products. And you can see, just like back in the case of our radical chain reactions, even though statistically there's only two chances for this blue pathway to occur, and there's actually six chances, three on this methyl group and three on this methyl group, for the green pathway to occur, the blue pathway still represents 90% of the products, and it is because of that stability difference. Okay, yeah, go ahead with your question. So will you always get two products like this, or is it ever going to be one or the other? Um, in the case of organic chemistry land, almost everything is a gray area. There's we have to leave behind our black and white, nice, tidy reactions. And if there are two products that could form, chances are that both products will form. It's just a question of how much is one favored. So um, in this case, it's a 90-10 mix. If you had a more, um, a more uh, strong difference between the two products, it might be 99 to 1. <laughs> If you had less of a difference between the products, it might be 50-50 or 60-40. I'm not going to ask you guys to um, be able to distinguish those things. Those are kind of like much more subtle, maybe for very advanced, um, like graduate school level organic chemistry classes. But what you guys do need to know is which one would be more favored. Um, and that's, a, that's the type of question I would ask about these. So... In this case, and in all E1 cases, the more substituted double bond will be formed preferentially. And that's actually listed out in a formal rule known as Zaitsev's rule. So if there's more than one elimination product possible, the more substituted alkene is going to dominate. And that is because of the thermodynamics and the stability associated with it. Okay, also from the slides on Wednesday, I showed you that the dehydration of alcohols also can fall into this category. So it's the same type of mechanism. It's completely parallel to everything we've been talking about. We just need to take into account a couple extra things for the special case of an alcohol. So we, um, overall, we're losing a water molecule here, right? Dehydration. So we're losing overall an elimination of a water molecule to give us our double bond. But we can't have the OH group leaving as OH minus. That's not a very good leaving group. So what we're going to do instead is to protonate our alcohol first so that when this group leaves, it leaves as a neutral water molecule, which is a good leaving group. That's more favorable. The other thing I want to note about this is that it is an equilibrium reaction. And so even though there are conditions that we can um, put into place to make this reaction happen to create an alkene, um, this alkene can actually hydrate again and go back to the starting material. So this is an equilibrium reaction. It can go in reverse. So the way this typically works in practice is that you would want to distill your alkene, which is going to be a lower boiling compound than whatever your alcohol was because of the strong intermolecular forces from the hydrogen bonding that we've now gotten rid of in our alkene. 
tests. We can distill our alkene, get it out of our product mixture, and that will help to drive the equilibrium reaction in this direction based on Le Chatelier's principle. Just like in E1 reactions and just like in SN1 reactions, because you're going to have a free carbocation intermediate, you can have rearrangements of the skeleton of your starting material. And just like E1, we are going to favor making the more substituted double bond according to Zaitsev's rule. So let's look again at the mechanism of this a little bit more closely. So as I said, OH minus is a poor leaving group. So the very first thing that we have to do to generate an E1 friendly situation is we're gonna add in some strong acid, in this case, sulfuric acid. And that sulfuric acid is a strong enough acid to protonate our hydroxyl group here. So we get a protonated alcohol group or a protonated hydroxyl group. Once it's protonated, now it becomes a very good leaving group. So that carbon oxygen bond breaks and the two electrons in that bond will go with the oxygen to give you a neutral water molecule as a leaving group. And of course, to leave behind your key carbocation intermediate. This ionization step is the slow step in the overall reaction. It is the, the rate limiting step. Once we have that carbocation intermediate, the last step looks just the same as it would if we started from an alkyl halide where our solvent or our water, um, whatever kind of a weak base we have around abstracts a proton from the carbon next door to our carbon cation, creating our pi bond using the two electrons that used to hold on that proton. Now, um, I mentioned this is a weak base. This can be a weak base because our carbocation intermediate is reactive. And so we don't need to have a very strong base. A weak base will be just fine to get this work done. The other thing I wanna point out is to really make sure everybody remembers it has to be the carbon next door to the carbocation. And this should make sense if you think about the orbitals, the um, bonding orbitals and, and um, empty orbitals that are, going, that are going into this reaction. So in our carbocation, we have an empty P orbital on our carbocation carbon. That's gonna be one of the P orbitals for our double bond. But in order to have a pi bond, we have to have two p orbitals next to each other and align the same way. So we need to create a p orbital on a neighboring carbon. And so that's why we're gonna take a proton off of the neighboring carbon is to create that p orbital. And the electrons that were used to hold that proton on can then become the electrons that are shared between the two p orbitals to create the pi bond. Okay. I wanna take a moment to compare E1 and SN1 mechanism. So if I haven't answered it already, this should answer the question, what's the difference between E1 and SN1? We've been talking about E1 elimination, where in the first step, we're gonna form a carbocation, and then our solvent or um, our weak base will reach over and deprotonate the carbon next door to then free up the electrons that were holding that proton on to become the double bond in our product. We are gonna lose an H plus and an X minus overall, and we're gonna create a pi bond in this process. If we compare that with an SN1 mechanism, in SN1 substitution reaction, we're not gonna do an elimination, right? We're gonna do a substitution instead. So it is the same first step where our leaving group will leave, our halogen leaving group is going to leave, and create a carbocation. It's the same carbocation intermediate. In the case of substitution, our solvent will reach over and attack our electrophilic carbon. So it'll act as a nucleophile to attack our electrophilic carbon and form a new carbon oxygen bond. And so if we look at the overall reaction, we have substituted a halogen with an oxygen group. And so that's the substitution as opposed to the elimination. And again, in elimination, our solvent is acting as a base to deprotonate. In substitution, our solvent is acting as a nucleophile to form a new nucleophile electrophile bond. So hopefully that answered your question about the difference between E1 and SN1. So next I wanna go on to E2 elimination and let E1 elimination kind of uh, sit and rest for a little while. 
These are very um, different mechanisms that have different consequences for the stereochemistry of the products. And so I want to talk about that. Um, we have been talking about E1 elimination. And again, just to remind everybody, it is a unimolecular rate law where only the alkyl halide is involved in the rate determining step. That alkyl halide um, bond breaks to create a carbocation intermediate. And as a reminder, the dehydration of alcohols also follows the same mechanism. It has the same rate determining step of breaking the carbon halogen bond. It's just that in the dehydration of alcohols, we have to do a precursor step where we protonate our alcohol to make it a better leaving group and make it more likely to break uh, that carbon oxygen bond in the E1 mechanism. Now we're gonna talk and focus our attention on E2. For E2 elimination, this is going to also be, again, an elimination. Um, we are still going to be removing a proton and an X minus group. So our overall reaction still involves eliminating an HX, just like an E1. And our overall reaction still involves creating a pi bond, just like an E1. The difference is that in E2, we are now in a bimolecular rate law sort of a situation where we have a strong base interacting with our alkyl halide to break and make all of our bonds all together, all in one concerted step. And so let's go through this in a little bit more detail. In E2, just like in SN2, that two stands for bimolecular, meaning that an E2 reaction has a rate law that involves two different molecules coming together. The mechanism is concerted, just like an SN2, meaning that bonds will be formed and broken all at the same time. And we'll see this on the next couple of slides. An E2 reaction requires a strong base to get that reaction to go. And this should make sense because we're not, um, that strong base is impacting and affecting all of the bonds being made and broken at the same time. So I have an example here where we're looking at an alkyl halide that happens to be a tertiary alkyl halide, right? That carbon that's bonded to your bromide is bonded to three other carbon atoms, making it a tertiary halide. And in the case of a tertiary halide, we know that even if we have a strong base like methoxide, our tertiary electrophile is too sterically hindered for an SN2 reaction to occur. Our methoxide, which is a good nucleophile, cannot reach and cannot access the electrophilic carbon. However, if you look at the idea that there's a carbon next door that has a CH bond, the sterics of getting to that proton are much, much more favorable, right? Not only is that carbon less hindered because of it being less substituted, but you don't actually need to even get to the carbon center. You can just grab a proton from the edge of the molecule. So in the case of E2, that's exactly what happens. A strong base can grab a proton that is attached to the carbon next to our carbon holding our alkyl halide. And then all at the same time, the electrons that were holding that proton on become pi bond electrons. And that pushes, um, that would push the carbon holding our halogen over its octet. So at the same time, our carbon halogen bond breaks and the halogen leaves with the two electrons as a halide. And again, the rate here has to do with not only our alkyl halide, but also our base in this case. Just like an E1 mechanism, as I mentioned, we are going to lose an H plus and we're going to lose an X minus, both a proton and an halide. So this is an elimination of HX. Here's another look at the same mechanism, but now I'm showing you the transition state. Um, and uh, actually, let me go back and answer this question. In the chat box, it says, would the concentration of the base also be written as the concentration of the solvent? So no, not necessarily. And that is because in this case, you could, for example, do an E2 reaction where you add a little bit of sodium methoxide in methanol. And so methanol would be the solvent. 
but methoxide would be the base. And so it, it has to be a strong base to get this reaction to work. So the rate law really does depend on, in this case, a base. Um, and most of the time, if you have a strong base like this uh, sodium methoxide or a deprotonated methanol, that's going to be not your solvent. Your solvent would probably be the protonated version. Did that answer your question? Cool. Okay. So back to our mechanism, a little deeper look at our E2 mechanism. So this is, um, uh, again, kind of trying to demonstrate here the concerted nature of an E2 reaction mechanism, where the entire flow of electrons, the deprotonation, the sigma bond breaking, the pi bond forming, and the alkyl halide bond breaking, this entire flow of electrons is all happening at the same time. So this is a single step to go from your alkyl halide starting material to your alkene product, going through a transition state that has these bonds partially formed and partially broken, um, depending on which bond we're talking about. So again, this is a concerted reaction. All of these events are happening in concert with each other at the same time. Bonds breaking, bonds forming, all of those are happening at the same time. This um, happens better for more substituted alkyl halides. So the tertiary alkyl halide, for example, will work faster than a secondary, which will work faster than a primary. And just like with E1 um, elimination, if you have a different proton that you could choose to abstract, so here we're taking the proton from a substituted carbon, right? We also could, in theory, take protons from either of these two methyl groups because they are also neighbors of the carbon where the alkyl halide is. And we, we could deprotonate either of these positions. And in fact, that probably does occur um, at some small level. But again, just like with E1 mechanisms, the more substituted product is going to be favored. And so that's called the Zaitsev product to give you the more substituted double bond. Okay, I'm going to point out here that I've kind of hinted at what's coming because I've used wedge and dash notation throughout this mechanistic view of how we're looking at things. And of course, in this case, all four of our substituents are methyl groups, so it doesn't make a difference. But in an E2 reaction mechanism, because it is concerted, the stereochemical information that was in these two carbon centers will carry through into our double bond. And I'll show you what I mean by that in the next couple of slides. It turns out that because the entire electron flow of bonds breaking and forming and breaking have to happen at the same time. We have to, for an E2 mechanism, we have to, we have to align all of our orbitals before we get started so that they're in the right position to be where they need to be in the end. What that means is that for an E2 mechanism, we have to achieve an anti-coplanar arrangement of our proton and our leaving group in order for the orbitals to be oriented the right way. And if you look at our orbital cartoon here, the hybrid orbital that is holding onto the proton and the hybrid sp3 orbital that is holding onto the halide are both in the plane of the screen right now. And these are lined up such that the blue um, lobes of each of these orbitals will become in will be coming into a situation where they can overlap with each other to form half of the pi bond and the green lobes of these hybrid orbitals will become overlapped and form the other half of the pi bond so because all of the breaking and forming and breaking happens in concert we can't start breaking or forming or breaking until we achieve this rotational confirmation it is called an anti coplanar transition state or an anti coplanar arrangement. And if you look at the Newman diagram of what we have to have in order to achieve this, it should make sense. It's a staggered confirmation. If you guys think back to chapter three, it's a staggered confirmation. So it's a lower in energy confirmation. And what you have in order to have these orbitals planar, you have your proton 
exactly opposite from your halogen leaving group in a Newman diagram, like I'm showing at the left here. When you have this kind of a situation, you have the anti-coplanar transition state. So just break this word down with me for a little bit. Coplanar means literally what it sounds like, that the orbitals involved are in the same plane as each other. So these two hybrid orbitals have to be coplanar because the p orbitals making up your pi bond end up having to be coplanar to get that overlap. And because the bonds are breaking and forming at the same time, we have to be in that orientation before we can get started. Okay. Um, that's, uh, these bullets actually say exactly what I just said, that these must be aligned in a coplanar fashion and they need to be anti to each other. So exactly opposite from each other. That's going to give you the lowest energy version of having these hybrid orbitals coplanar. Um, I'm going to show you the other possibility to have the hybrid orbitals coplanar. And that looks like this. So, um, in the top case, they're anti coplanar and in a staggered Newman diagram confirmation. The only other way we could get both of these hybrid orbitals into the plane of the screen is to adopt what's called a syn coplanar transition state, where we've rotated our uh, the right half of this molecule around 180 degrees so that it's still in the plane, the orbital is still in the plane of the screen, but now it's on the same side as the other hybrid orbital. This is not a favored confirmation because it is an eclipsed confirmation, so it is higher in energy because of the sterics and the electronic repulsion involved. But it does, this is, this is the only other possible way to get our hybrid orbitals aligned in the same plane so that they're, they can be converted into a pi orbital. So like I said, this is possible, but it is not favored because of the high energy uh, required to, to generate this sort of pre-organized um, conformational configuration. Okay, so again, for an E2 mechanism, we want to arrange our molecule in a Newman diagram that has an anti-coplanar conformation. So it turns out that this, this absolutely dictates the stereochemistry of the alkene product. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is best seen by an example, but it means that the reaction can be considered stereospecific, meaning the specific information of the stereochemistry of the starting material will translate in some way to be the same, um, uh, the same specific information in the product. So I know that was possibly a little bit confusing, but I think it'll be clear when you see um, when you see a, an example. And the best way to do this is to draw out a Newman projection. So here's an example of an elimination that we're gonna do using an E2 mechanism. And you can see the stereochemistry of this molecule has a methyl group and a phenyl group coming out towards us and a phenyl group and a hydrogen going back behind us when we have our molecule oriented so that the relevant bonds to an E2 mechanism are in the plane of the page. So I've oriented this on purpose, doing the required rotation around the carbon-carbon single bond to get the anti-coplanar transition state that we need. And if I draw a Newman diagram as if I'm looking down this carbon-carbon bond from the left-hand side, it does indeed look like the Newman diagram we need it to look like, where our proton that's going to be removed is directly across from our halogen that's going to be leaving. When I have this kind of anti-coplanar transition state and I do my E2 reaction, I'm going to be breaking this carbon-hydrogen bond using those electrons to become the electrons of the pi bond, which you can see in our product. Here's one p orbital of the pi bond and the second p orbital of the pi bond will be behind it. And then the halide is going to leave with its two electrons. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things here. I'm going to color code this a little bit so that we can follow and track everything. Um, because we have to have this pre-organized, pre-arranged scenario, whatever we have on the left-hand side of our anti-coplanar plane of our Newman diagram will end up on the same side of the double bond, right? 
And I'm going to trace that back for you into the starting material and note that that is the phenyl group and the hydrogen that are pointed back behind the plane of the screen. We can tell that because if we're looking at our Newman diagram from this direction, those would be to our left because they'd be behind the screen and you can see them then here. Likewise, the other side, the right hand side of our Newman diagram ends up on the same side of the double bond. And those are the two substituents that were um, kind of pointed forward or coming out of the screen at us in uh, in our, oops, sorry, here we go. Um, those are the substituents that were pointed out towards us uh, in our original configuration. And so now if we take this Newman diagram on the far right here and draw it as the target product, we can see that when we do that, Oh my gosh, sorry, my pen's going a little crazy. When we do that, we can look at our Newman diagram and see that if this carbon here is the carbon in the front, then we're going to have a phenyl group, a red phenyl group on one side that will match up with the hydrogen on the other side from the other carbon. And then on the other side of our double bond, we have a methyl group and a phenyl group on the same side of the double bond. So keep in mind and keep paying attention that you have to make sure you're paying attention to what's attached to a carbon. So on one carbon of our double bond, we're going to have a phenyl group that's red and a methyl group that's purple attached. And on the opposite side, we'll have a hydrogen atom and a phenyl group, again, red and purple in that order. But these, the, the location of these two substituents is dictated by the orientation that they are forced to have based on this orientation, so this rotational conformation and this Newman diagram. And again, because we are breaking and making these bonds all at the same time, we cannot do any rotation from here before our pi bond forms. So the set, the set orientation of this Newman diagram dictates the geometry of our double bond in the end. So I know that was probably kind of confusing, but if you guys walk through this on your own, when I post these slides, I'll post them with these kind of color coding, um, uh, color coded um, uh, annotations on the slides. So you guys will be able to see that. Okay, the last thing I want to say about E2 mechanisms is what happens if you have an E2 elimination that you want to do in a cyclohexane ring. So say I wanted to do this reaction up at the top where I wanted to take this alkyl bromide that is in a cyclohexane and I wanted to eliminate it to give us cyclohexene. So the trick here is to note that in a chair form, in the favored chair form where your halogen, if it's the only substituent, would be equatorial because what we know about chair forms, we cannot do an E2 elimination of an equatorial halogen atom. Even though that's the favored chair conformation, it turns out that whatever is anti-coplanar to the equatorial position is the carbon of a ring. So you can see that here um, in our in our Newman diagram of after the ring flip, if you just look at any of these equatorial positions, directly across from any of the equatorial positions is a carbon of the ring, which means it's not a proton that can be abstracted. So in order to do an E2 of a cyclohexane, you have to do a ring flip or a chair-chair interconversion to put your leaving group in the axial position. Because then and only then, will you have a chance that there might be an anti-coplanar proton that can get deprotonated? So that's what this bullet here down at the bottom says. You can only achieve an anti-coplanar conformation if both the hydrogen or the proton to be removed and the halogen are in axial positions. So in this case, you have to do a chair flip to be able to make that happen. Okay, so that covers us for E1 and E2. 
everything that I just said is also in the slides that were posted for Wednesday's lecture, the video that was posted for Wednesday's, Wednesday's lecture. So I'm going to use the rest of the time to discuss alkene nomenclature, and if we have time, I'll touch on degrees of unsaturation. For alkenes, the nomenclature strongly mirrors that of alkanes, so I'm just going to take some a couple of moments to point out the differences. One of the key features for naming alkenes is that what we have to do to find our main chain is we have to find the longest continuous chain. That's the same as before. But now our longest continuous chain has to include our alkene. It has to include the double bonded carbons. So even if there's a longer chain somewhere else in the molecule, we have to make sure that the, the main chain that we use for naming our base compound includes the double bonded carbons. We're going to use the same bases that we base names that we used before, except that instead of ending in A-N-E, we're going to end in E-N-E for alkenes. And when we go to number our chain, we want to number it so that the double bond has the lowest possible number. That's going to be the most important feature here. So even if the double bond is not the closest substituent to an end, uh, it still needs to be the, the feature that defines how we number the chain. So let's see some examples that will help drive these points home. Okay, so in the molecule on the left here, we have four carbons. So we know it's a butane base, but we have a double bond, so it's going to be a butene. There are two different versions for where to put that number of the double bond. The old IUPAC names, which I personally favor because they're easier to say, they put that um, numbering for your alkene right in front of the word butene. But in the new version, it puts it directly in front of the ene suffix. Either one of these is acceptable on quizzes or tests, and your, both, your book uses both. Um, like it'll put both oftentimes when it's talking about nomenclature. So in pentene, in our case of one pentene, which we have on the right here, our double bond is pos between positions one and two. So we have one pentene or pent one e. If that double bond is not at the end of the molecule, then we still number our chain from one end to the other, giving our double bond the lowest numbers. So in the case of two butene, it doesn't matter if we number left to right or right to left, because the symmetry in the molecule means our double bond will be positions two and three either way and we use the lowest number to say which one it is. So this is 2-butene or butuene. In the case of pentene, however, our double bond, our, our molecule doesn't have the same symmetry. So we have to number this from left to right because that will give our double bond numbers two and three. If we numbered it from right to left, then our double bond would have numbers three and four and that's no good. So we have a 2-pentene or a pent-2-ene. Um, and the next, uh, the next examples that I'm going to give you are what happens in a ring. In a ring, what we are going to see is that the, um, the double bond is always going to be assigned as carbon one and carbon two. And because of that, we will always know it's carbon one and carbon two. And so we don't actually have to even designate that it's number one in the name. So cyclohexene is just cyclohexene and not cyclohex one ene or anything like that, right? Um, if we have substituents on that ring, then we want to choose which of the carbons of the double bond will be one, two versus the other to keep the substituent numbers the lowest. So here we have a methyl group directly attached to the double bond. So we're going to have one methyl cyclopentene as opposed to two methyl cyclopentene if we had the double bond numbering reversed. And again, this one refers to where the methyl group is. We don't have to state where the ene group is because it will always between, be between carbons one and two in a ring. If we have a substituent that's not directly attached to the double bond, again, we just choose our one and two so that whatever the substituents are have the lowest numbers. So in this case, we have three methylpentene as opposed to what would be five methylpentene if we started our double bond numbering the opposite direction and went around this way. Okay, hopefully that all makes sense. We have a couple more things to discuss that are very important with nomenclature, so let's get to those. If we have more than one double bond in our molecule, 
then we have to designate where each of them are, right? And so in that case, we give a number for the location of each of them. And we also say how many they are the same way we would say how many, for example, methyl groups they are by using a di, tri, or tetra and sticking that di, tri, or tetra just before ene. So you can see this best in examples, of course. Um, in this case, we have a, a four carbon molecule. So it's a bute, uh, like a butane base. There are two double bonds. So it's going to be a butadiene, di for the two and ene for the double bonds. And those double bonds are going to be at positions one and three. So we have a one, three butadiene or a buta one, three diene in the new and kind of annoying IUPAC names. The molecule on the right we can see is a 135 heptatriene, and this should match up and make sense to you guys. So hepta, because we have a seven carbon chain, triene, because there are three double bonds in there, and 135 tells us the position of those double bonds, one, three, and five. And notice we've numbered this chain from right to left because that gives us the lowest double bond numbers possible, a one, three, five um, uh, situation. Okay, and of course this holds for cyclic alkenes as well. In this case, we have a cyclo octa one, three, five, seven tetraene or a one, three, five, seven cyclo octa tetraene. And you should be able to see how that um, works with this molecule. Brittany, you have a question? Yeah, um, why did you go on the first one? I see you went one, two, three, four, but why was the other one backwards? I'm sorry. Okay, you want to choose your numbering order so that your double bond numbers are the lowest. In this case over here, it didn't matter if we went left to right or like right to left, it would give us the same answer. But if we tried to number this one on the right, the molecule on the right, the heptatriene, starting from this methyl group, then it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and our double bonds would be at positions two, four, and six, instead of one, three, and five, and you want the lowest numbers for your double bonds. Did that answer your question, Brittany? Uh, yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we need now in the last couple of minutes of class to cover some really key stuff. So, um, we have seen cis and trans isomers already, you guys know this. But I didn't harp on this before, but I'm harping on it now. In order to be able to assign cis or trans, you have to have identical groups on the double bond, either on the same side. So in this case, the hydrogen atoms are identical. And so we can call this a cis two pentene. And in this case, they're opposite from each other, but it's the hydrogen atoms, which are identical, which makes this a trans two pentene. We can't actually use the methyl and ethyl groups for this because they're different from each other, right? And so you can see that not every alkene is going to show or be able to be assigned a cis or trans. For example, if they have four different substituents attached, then you don't have any two that are exactly the same as each other. So we need, and you can see lots of examples out there that are neither cis nor trans. But if we run into a case where we have four different substituents and we cannot assign a cis trans, we still have to be able to give an assignment that will tell other people the stereochemistry. Remember, IUPAC rules are all about being unambiguous. Um, don't worry about this slide. We've talked about this before, so we don't need to worry about that now. The easy nomenclature is what we're going to do to address these cases where cis and trans are inadequate to describe a molecule unambiguously. And so in order to do this easy nomenclature, we're actually going to use tools we already know. We're going to take each end of the double bond and we're going to assign priority labels to the substituents on each end using the Kahn Ingold prelog rules that you guys already know for R and S stereochemistry. If your highest priority groups end up on the same side of the double bond, then that double bond can be assigned a Z configuration or Zusammen, the German word for same. If they're on opposite sides as each other, then they get an E designation for the German word for opposite. So let's see an example. And here's the step-by-step step step way of doing this. We are going to assign a priority to the two groups attached to a carbon. So in our example here on the left, let's look at the carbon uh, on the right first. Uh, hopefully everybody agrees that a methyl group is a higher priority than a hydrogen atom. 
So our methyl is going to get a one. Our hydrogen is going to get a two. These are the two priority groups bonded to the same carbon. Now we're going to go to the other carbon involved in the double bond and do the same thing. Looking at our two groups, a bromine and a chlorine, we know that conningled prelog goes by atomic weight or atomic number, and so our bromine will be the highest priority over our chlorine. So one and two. And then if we look at how this works, our top priority groups are on opposite sides of the double bond from each other. They're diagonal from each other. And so we can give this double bond an E designation. Here's just another example where we can give our substituents um, our priority group labels. The carbon with the oxygen outweighs or outranks the carbon with only hydrogens attached, so it's number one. And the ethyl group outranks the methyl group, so it's number one. You can see these are across from each other in the E isomer and on the same side as each other in the Z isomer. So even if a double bond is on a ring, it can still show stereoisomers. We can also show in like multiple double bonds in one molecule, we can still specify this and each one has to be specified independently. So the bond at position three is going to be a Z double bond because the bromine is the highest priority group. And so the bromine is on the same side as the alkyl group that's the highest priority group off of the other side, the other carbon, making this a Z double bond for the three position. And the five position is an E double bond because the two alkyl groups, which are the highest priority items, are across from each other. So take a moment and look at this 3-4 double bond and note how tempting it is to call it E because your carbon chain is across from each other. But just know that you still have to find the highest priority, which in this case is the bromine. Okay. In the last couple of minutes of class, I'm going to give you guys um, some in-class participation problems, but I'll come back to this in a second. But before I do, I'm not going to get to degrees of unsaturation today. So before Monday, I want everyone to read this section to be able to be primed for Monday. And I'll post this details uh, when I post the slide. The rest of the time, which isn't very much, I'm going to give you guys to work on this participation um, assignment for today and just take a moment in the last couple of minutes and give this your best shot and upload your um, answers before the end of the day today in Canvas. And I'll stick around and answer questions for a couple of minutes and I'll leave this slide up so you guys can be um, thinking about these things. Possibly go back to the um, cis and trans slide. Um, I don't want to go back to the cis and trans slide because I want people to be able to have a chance to do these. Oh, okay. okay. But I can talk about it a little bit. And that is to say that for cis and trans, in order to give a cis or trans designation, you have to have two of the same groups, identical groups, um, in the right position to be able to call that cis or trans. And in the case of E or Z, you don't have to have groups that are the same. You can still give an E or Z designation. So the E or Z designation is much more universal and can be kind of universally applied to any double bond situation. Did that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Could you explain the difference between E and Z again? Yeah, so E, and actually I should probably write it on here just because you guys are just learning this. Um, so 
you give a Z designation if your highest priority groups are on the same side of the double bond. And you give an E designation if your highest priority groups are on the opposite side of the double bond. So you're going to use your con angled prelog rules, the same rules that you use to define R and S. And you're going to basically give a priority label, either one or two, to the two substituents attached to a carbon of a double bond. And then you do that for the other carbon of the double bond. And then you look and see the relationship, uh, the, the geometric relationship of the two top priority groups to each other. Did that help? Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'll stick around for another five minutes, but I'm going to, um, I realized I didn't make your upload spot active. So I'm going to be doing that in the background, but if you guys have questions, just feel free to, you know, jump in and ask. <laughs> 